Hello friends, uh, today we will start with the, the new topic on uh, strengthening mechanism. Uh, as I told you when we were discussing plastic deformation that this is one of the motive of uh, our understanding of how the crystal deform, okay, so that I can uh, design or tailor microstructure or if I can do something in the material by which I can increase the strength of the material, okay. Basically, I want to alter the properties of the material, okay, and all this understanding uh, helps me to do that. Okay. So, we will start with the strengthening mechanism. Okay. So, there will be different strengthening mechanisms which we are going to discuss. So, my objective when I want to define uh, uh, when I want to discuss strengthening mechanism is to increase the strength of the material that is my objective. Now, there can be two strategies to do that. First is remove all the defects from the material. Okay. If you remember we discussed that the uh, strength of the material, theoretical strength, okay, shear strength for example, of the material is uh, shear modulus divided by some uh, constant here 2 pi. Now, shear modulus is in giga Pascal. So, if you divide it by 2 pi also order of magnitude will almost remain same, it will be in giga Pascal. Whereas, all our experimental strength, shear strength is in mega Pascal. So, there is a three order of magnitude difference between what is theoretically calculated and what you have uh, found out experimentally. And we said that there are some defects in the material which is bringing down the strength and these defects we call as dislocations. So, first strategy is obviously for me is to remove all these defects because these defects are bringing down the strength of the material. Okay, which is of course not an easy task to do okay, when you are talking about bulk material because during the processing itself you generate so many defects. In some material people have uh, achieved this kind of condition which are called whiskers. Okay, so, the idea for whiskers is that you make the dimension of the material so small, okay, suppose uh, the mean free distance between two defects. Okay, is in some micron, let us say 10 micron or 20 micron or so. Okay, so, one dislocation and another dislocation there is this much distance is there or one point defect to next point defect some distance will be there may be in micron, 5 micron, 1 micron whatever. So, if I make my dimension of one, one of the dimension of the material in that range. Okay. So, let us say I make a material whose diameter or make a make a wire which has a diameter equal to around 1 micron let us say. Then my dimension is lower than the mean free distance of the defects. Okay. So, I am practically eliminating all the defects from the material. Okay. Of course, I have to go to that kind of length scale to do that and this is done in some type of materials which are called whiskers which which are very fine uh, basically wires and then you combine them together and in those material where we could achieve uh, no defect kind of condition uh, when people uh, did experiment and found out the strength they were in the range of uh, giga pascal okay so basically defects are the main reason to bring down the strength now this is a very expensive business to do all these things another way to do is this is second strategy is that i introduce too many defects if i am not able to remove them let's introduce large number of defects in the material Okay, so, that they can start interacting with each other, okay, they will start uh, cutting down each other kind of and that will increase the strength. Okay, so, the, all the strengthening mechanism is based on this second strategy that increase the number of defects, let them interact with each other okay, and thereby you can increase the strength of the material. So, we know that the strength is intimately related to dislocation motion. Okay, so, yield at yield also what we say slip start taking place, the plastic deformation start taking place and we know that slip takes place because of dislocation motion. Okay, so, strength is intimately related with dislocation. Similarly, UTS also if you see, we say the, that the material st strengthened from yield stress to UTS because of strain hardening and strain hardening is 
because dislocations are interacting with each other. Okay, so again there is a uh, 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 that dislocations are the main important uh, uh, you unit you can say which decide the strength of the material. Okay, so if I can hinder the motion of the dislocation by any mechanism, okay, then I am increasing the strength of the material. Okay, so the idea for increasing the strength of material or strengthening mechanism. Uh, to understand strengthening mechanism is to put disloc uh, the obstacle in the path of dislocation movement. Okay, you put some some barriers basically, and that is what you can see that all these cars have piled up because there is a barrier here. Okay, and they are kind of getting piled up, and of course you can see that uh, the lead dislocation uh, as they are piling up. Okay, and then the, there will be a lot of stress on the lead dislocation and there, there will also be a back stress on the other dislocation which are going to come. Okay, so, for example, a new car comes, he, it sees that there, are, there is so much pile up, maybe it will like to take some alternate route rather than standing in the line. Okay, maybe some uh, kacha road if it is available uh, close by, it will try to take that so that it can uh, somehow uh, get rid of this pile up. Similarly, the lead one, so the front car will see the kind of pressure of all the cars. So, if some, so it, it, it is not able to, uh, it, uh, the engine has stopped because of some reason and it, it is not able to start, all the others will start honking, okay. they will start putting pressure on the lead one. Okay. So, there is a back pressure and there is a stress concentration on the lead one also okay, from the all the dislocation which are behind it. Okay, and the other dislocation which are coming, they will see that there is a back pressure building up. Okay. So, by doing that, we are making it difficult for dislocation to move. So, when it sees so many dislocation, the next dislocation will find it difficult to move because there is a lot of back pressure uh, build up, there is a lot of stress co concentration because of the all the dislocation which are in the queue. Okay. So, that is the strategy. So, dislocation pile up uh, takes place at the barrier. Okay. So, barrier can be uh, another dislocation okay. and if, if the barrier is another dislocation and because of that if you are getting strengthening then it is called work hardening. So, because of dislocation, dislocation interaction. If the barrier is a grain boundary then it will be called grain boundary strengthening. Okay. If barrier is uh, precipitates then it will be called precipitation hardening if barrier is point defect then it will be called solid solution hardening okay so we will see each one of them okay uh, i have grouped this uh, three uh, actually uh, these three are the ones which are you can call as strong obstacle And this is a, actually a weak obstacle. So these are a strong obstacle. This is a weak obstacle. Actually, I can also divide them in different uh, way, or I can group in different way. Okay, if you see these three, okay, the point defect and the precipitate and the dislocation, these three barrier come within the grain. So, they provide the barrier within the grain itself, whereas grain boundary provide the barrier at the boundary of the grain. Okay. So, you can uh, make another group of this okay, like this also that this point defect, precipitation def hardening, solid solution hardening and work hardening, they provide the barrier within the grain. Okay. So, you have a grain, let us say I am just making a hexagonal kind of grain. Okay, so, all these defects will be this 1, 2 and 3 will be within the grain and the fourth one the grain boundary strengthening is only at the grain boundary. Okay. So, I can divide this into this way also. Now, my dislocation can also do a uh, can overcome this pile up as I told you that if a, a, a car comes and it sees uh, so many uh, there is a pile up of cars okay, or there is a queue of cars it will try to take some other uh, route. Okay. That is what dislocation can also do. For example, one of the mechanism is called dislocation climb. 
okay, which is dependent on the vacancy concentration in the material. Okay, so, for example, you have a dislocation like this, so this is the extra half plane ending here and there is an obstacle here and this dislocation want to move in this direction. Okay. What happens, uh, there is a vacancy for example, suppose there is a vacancy around here next to this obstacle. Okay. So, what will happen, this atom above this uh, where the dislocation is ending, it has jumped into this vacancy creating thereby creating a vacancy now at the where the its earlier position was there and the atom which is uh, at the end of the dislocation core that has now jumped up okay in the vacant position okay so thereby you have a dislocation climb now okay dislocation has climbed by one atomic distance so instead of ending here now it is ending in this plane and thereby it has circumvented this particular obstacle. So, now it can move in this plane without any problem. So, this is one way of uh, circumventing the uh, barrier by dislocation. Okay. So, it can also relieve the stresses at this location in the pileup by nucleating dislocation in adjacent grain or by nucleating a crack. So, these are other way of relieving the stress or it can do a uh, a climb process to overcome the pileup. Now, as I told you that there are three mechanisms which are within the grain. So, let us start with the dislocation point defect interaction. Okay. That means, uh, one of the method by which we have strengthening is called solid solution strengthening. So, it will come under point defect. Okay. So, you have point defects like vacancies or solute atoms. So, what how they provide strengthening? Okay. So, these defects are associated with uh, some strain field around them. Okay. For example, vacancies introduce tensile stress field around them. Okay. Substitutional solute atom create tensile strain field if the size is smaller than the solute. Okay. So, it will in, in that sense these two are going to be same. Okay whatever is the means by which uh, vacancies introduce tensile stress, the same will be true for a substitutional solute atom having a smaller size. Then there can be a compressive strain field if the size is bigger than the solute atom. Okay. So, this is for substitutional solute atom, for interstitial atoms also this is will be true. If the atom is having a larger size than the interstitial position, okay, then it is going to put a strain on the nearby atoms okay, and they, that will be a compressive stress. Okay. So, this will be true for an interstitial atom also whose size is bigger than the size of the interstitial site. So, you have different tensile and uh, compressive field associated with different type of defects. We also know that dislocation also have a strain field. For example, in edge dislocation there is a compressive at the end of the extra half plane and tensile below it. Okay, so, I will just show you all the images for these three cases uh, in the next slide. So, for example, uh, if you look at the dislocation, so lattice strain around dislocation. So, this is the edge dislocation ending here. So, you have compressive stress field uh, on the top because you are introducing an extra half plane okay, there and there will be a tensile strain field in the bottom. Okay, because uh, now uh, these these bonds are stretched, you can see here. Okay, all these bonds are stretched in a stretched condition, and there because of that there will be a tensile strain field around that. And similarly, because I am putting then extra half plane here, so all these atoms are going to be in compressive condition. Okay, so there is a compression tension uh, strain field associated with edge dislocation. With the screw dislocation, you do not get a two different strain field. There is a, a spherical strain field uh, or a circular strain field around the dislocation. Okay. So, in that case, it will be different than what you are seeing in the edge dislocation. Now, if you look at the point defect, okay, suppose there is a vacancy or there is a solute atom which is a, of a smaller size. Okay, what will happen? All these atoms which are next to the vacancies, they are in a stretched position now. So, you can see the, the distance between the atom has increased, whereas distance between where it is, it has not affected the atom, 
the distance is small and here the distance is between the atom is more. So, all these atoms which are next to the uh, this uh, vacancy is they are in strained position okay? and this strain is of tensile nature. If I put a bigger substitutional atom, okay, so this is for a vacancy or smaller solute atom, so both cases. In this case you have, you are going to get, so in this case I have tensile strain field, in this case I will have compressive strain field. Okay, so, you can see that all the atoms are pushed uh, very close to the next atoms. Of course, this will uh, propagate, I am not able to show it, okay. I am just showing it for the next uh, neighboring atoms. Okay, so, this is actually the distance between the equilibrium distance between the two atoms supposed to be there. Now, th th uh, the atoms which are next to this bigger atom, they are in compression. Okay. So, now this compressive field or this tensile field will interact with the tensile or compressive field of the dislocation. So, dislocation will feel uh, very nice if it is, if the tensile part is seeing the, for example, here the compressive part of the strain field around this particular atom. Okay. So, the tensile part will get cancelled out by the compressive part here or if it sees this vacancy here, then the compressive part will be cancelled out by the tensile strain field of the. So, thereby dislocation will be able to reduce its strain energy. Okay. So, that is what it wants to reduce its strain energy okay. and that is how they are in going to interact and that is how they are going to the dislocation is going to see a kind of a barrier. So, it will like to be there because it is comfortable there. Okay. So, vacancies like what will happen that when you they, they, there is a dislocation sometime vacancy will like to go and sit where the uh, compressive strain field is there okay, to the tensile strain field of the dislocation uh, sorry it will should be you can see like the compressive similarly solute atoms depending upon their size like to accumulate around dislocation core. This atmosphere of point defects around dislocation put a drag force. Now, if I want to move dislocation now with these defects uh, 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 around the dislocation core, okay, my dislocation has reduced its, its strain energy and if I want to move it, okay, so it, it, it would like to carry those uh, defects with, with it okay, and which this will create a drag force on the dislocation. Okay because now it is not only the movement of dislocation, the point defect also, also need to be moved together. If we increase the applied stress to a very large extent, maybe dislocation will be able to break free from the these defects. Okay. So, we, that is also possible that I apply a very li large stress, uh, uh, this um, shear stress and that will help the dislocation to break away from these defects. So, it gives rise to uh, what, what this dislocation point defect interaction does other than giving solid solution hardening is that it gives rise to upper yield point uh, strain aging and solid solution strengthening. Okay. So, all these three things are possible with this interaction between dislocation and point defects. So, if you look at the solid solution hardening as I told you dislocation will uh, reduce its strain energy if the these kind of defects are there around the core. Okay, so, you can see that there is a, 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 a comparison. So, if I keep on increasing the nickel in, the, in a copper nickel system, uh, if you remember when we were discussing copper nickel system, we said this is an isomorphous system. That means, I can add any amount of copper okay, uh, in, in a, uh, and any amount of uh, uh, nickel in, uh, in to make an alloy okay, because it is isomorphous system, there is no solubility limit. Okay. So, that is why you can see this is a nickel content is increasing, as nickel content is increasing my tensile strength is increasing. Okay. Similarly, my yield strength is increasing, however, my ductility of the material is decreasing. 
Okay, so if I increase the amount number uh, 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 amount of nickel in this copper nickel alloys, okay, then my tensile strength and yield strength increases, ductility reduces. Okay, this is usually the case with all the strengthening mechanisms, most of them, that when you increase the tensile or uh, yield strength, your ductility reduces. Okay. So, as I told you that why this solid solution hardening takes place is because of pinning of dislocation by strain field associated with the solute atom. Okay. So, between dislocation and solute atom the interaction is there and that is helping you to increase the strength. As you can see from 0 to 50 percent of nickel here, I am increasing the tensile strength from around maybe 225 mega Pascal to uh, to 400 mega Pascal or so. Okay. Similarly, yield strength I am increasing from around uh, let us say this is uh, this 50, 80, around 70 or 60 or 70 to around 160. So, uh, a very big uh, difference in the strength. Of, of course, the ductility is reducing from a value of 55 to around 30 percent. Okay. Now, uh, if you remember when we were discussing tensile uh, curves of steel and aluminum, I said in steel actually you get a very uh, prominent yield point phenomena or very clear yield point you get. So, this is your elastic part, okay, linear part, then very sharp yield point and at after that there is a drop in the stress and then there is uh, some kind of uh, you can see serrations are there. Okay, so it, it is like this kind of serrations. This is what we call as yield elongation. Okay, and this is my upper yield point. This is my lower yield point. And after certain elongation, then the strain hardening uh, starts. Okay, so this is this whole phenomena is called yield point elongation. Uh, sorry, yield point phenomena. Okay, and Yield point elongation is that they show a localized heterogeneous transition from elastic to plastic deformation. Okay. So, uh, why we are calling it as heterogeneous because it is starts from uh, one end and it goes to the another end. Okay. So, as you can see that the hedged region here is the, uh, is the, uh, is the location where the yielding has started. But in some of the portion of the material yielding has not started yet. So, it is starting from for example, some end here and then it is propagating. So, you can see in the next stage somewhere here the yielding has uh, increased up to this portion of the material and this much is remaining the unyielded metal. And, and the third stage if you can see the most of the material has yielded still some portion has left. Okay, and then at the end of course, the whole material will be yielded. So, you can see that this is a heterogeneous transition from elastic to plastic deformation. Okay. It is not uniform uh, deformation throughout the sample as we said that uh, deformation is going to be uniform throughout the sample. And this banding which you see here, the uh, two bands are moving towards each other, these are called Luders bands. Okay. Uh, scientist gave the name uh, uh, first uh, discovered them. So, on his behalf it, it is named like this. So, if you want to see that what this uh, yield point phenomena is, the load after the upper yield point suddenly dropped to approximately a constant value lower yield point and then rises with further strain. The elongation which occurs at constant load is called yield point elongation which is heterogeneous deformation. Luder bands are formed at approximately 45 degree to the tensile axis during yield point elongation and propagate over the specimen. So, again 45 degree is coming back here okay. and why 45 degree? Again you have maximum shear stress acting in that direction to the principal stress that is our tensile uh, stress okay. and that is how the Luder band forms and then it grows and uh, then it consumes the whole material. So, this is one way of yielding in uh, plain carbon steel or low carbon steel okay, which takes place. The upper point is associated with a small amount of interstitial or substitutional impurities. Now, why this uh, yielding uh, this type of phenomena takes place? Okay. 
the reason is that the solute atom either carbon or nitrogen in do carbon steel see the, the uh, for any material whether if it is annealed material also dislocations are always going to be there in the material okay so to start with the dislocation is going to be there in the material now as i told you that the dislocation has a strain field and the solute atom also have a strain field so these uh, um, uh, atoms like to go and sit at the core of the dislocation depending upon what kind of strain fields are there okay so all the dislocations are always already decorated or uh, there is a kind of atmosphere of these solute atom at the core of the dislocation so when we start the deformation process okay as i told you that uh, there will be a, a kind of a locking of this dislocation because of this solute atom so if i keep on applying the stress on the material okay so you are uh, forcing the dislocation to move but these atoms are the solute atoms are pinning the dislocation but at some point you will have sufficient stress on the dislocation so that it starts moving okay and it will be it will be pulled away from these solute atoms okay so where it starts breaking away from the these uh, atoms that is my upper yield point so uh, my stress is sufficient so that uh, it is allowing the dislocation to get rid of this solute atoms so so as soon as they get rid of this solute atom okay they are free to move so suddenly there is a drop of the uh, drop in the stress because now they are free to move okay and then they are moving okay so the luder band will start from two ends then it will progress so that yield point elongation at that time the whole material is getting consumed by the yielding process okay and when the whole material is yielded okay now the dislocation has started moving in whole of the volume of the material then the strain hardening part will start okay so it will raise the initial yield stress so this carbon and uh, nitrogen because of locking when the dislocation is pulled free from the solute atom slip can occur at lower stress the magnitude of yield point depend on the interaction energy and concentration of solute atoms the yield point phenomena has been observed in iron titanium molybdenum cadmium and so on zinc aluminum alloys okay in some aluminum alloys you will see yield point phenomena so the upper and lower yield point okay if you see uh, this is an actual image of a luder band formation okay in the steel uh, the source is also given here so you can see that how they are forming and they are going to progress over each, each other and then they will consume the whole material now the problem with this luder band is that it affect the surface finish of the formed component okay you can see that they are uh, going to leave some this kind of stretch marks on the on the surface okay so suppose if you are doing a sheet metal forming okay uh, you have a sheet uh, which contains lot of dislocation already carbon is there and it is sitting in the uh, at the core of the dislocation and you want to deform for making some car body for example and if this luder band formation takes place okay it will affect the surface finish of the sheet because of the formation of this you will see some kind of marks on that okay and a, a customer when he goes and he sees those marks he will not like it he will say that there is a, there is some defect in the material okay so this has prompted development of another class of steel called interstitial free steel okay so this is another type of steel so you get rid of all interstitial atoms okay so that you have a interstitial free steel okay and uh, you can get rid of this uh, luder band formation if there are no solute atoms in the or uh, these interstitial atoms are there in the material okay so now nowadays all the sheet forming uh, you will see that this interstitial free steels are used okay and uh, that is why now the painting jobs also also become simpler earlier old uh, uh, automobiles if you see they used to put a putty over the sheet of the surface to make a, a, a very smooth finish on the surface and then they used to paint it nowadays the painting is directly done over the sheet okay because all these problems are not there 
Okay, another uh, problem with uh, solute atom and dislocation is called strain aging. Okay, so what do we mean by that? So this phenomena in which the strength of a material increase with uh, with a loss in ductility after being heated at relatively low temperature after cold working. Okay, so what does it mean? For example, if you can see this is a normal uh, your elastic part, then upper yield point, lower yield point, yield elongation, yield point elongation, and then strain hardening. Okay, suppose I stop the deformation at this point and I bring it back to the uh, if I remove the load, for example, so my load is removed. I have, but this much strain will remain because this is the plastic part. And uh, one more interesting thing you can see that this is not going to be the strain in the material. Okay, I have shown the strain of the material by a, a slanted curve here. Okay. So, for any deformation process there is always going to be some strain which is going to be recovered. So, this is my recovered strain and this is my permanent strain. Okay. So, this is permanent and this is recovered. So, whenever I will stop the deformation okay the the total it will not be this strain which i can plot uh, get by drawing a, a perpendicular line to the strain axis okay it will always be some strain which is going to be recovered and this phenomena is called spring back just uh, i i forgot to tell you maybe earlier okay that is why i am bringing it here now that this much is strain is recovered and this this phenomena is called spring back. Why it is important is because when you are doing deformation and when you remove the load some some material some deformation will be recovered. Okay. So, if you are designing a part okay, and uh, suppose you have designed by the total strain. Okay, so, it, it after deformation its length should be this much and this is going to be attached to another part. Okay, and this part is also going to be attached to another part and this is what you wanted to have the strain in the material after deformation. So, suppose if you are taking the total strain what will happen there will be some recovery. So, you will find out after the deformation that uh, the, the, the length of the part is smaller than what you wanted to attach. Okay, so, what you have to do is if you want this much strain in the material always deform to a higher extent. Okay, so, that you can get this much total strain and how you can get this line the actually this line is parallel to the your elastic part the linear part. Okay, so, basically where you have you have, you have stopped the deformation from there you plot a line parallel to this linear elastic part okay, and wherever it is cutting this axis and this will be your total strain this much is recovered this much is permanent. So, if I want this much as the total strain uh, is permanent strain in the material I have to have a higher total strain in the material then I can have this much as the permanent deformation. Okay. This is something just a kind of a I have rerouted something here anyway. So, what we are doing here is you have deformation upper yield point and then you started deforming okay, under uh, the strain hardening part and you have stopped the deformation here and you have removed the load. Okay. Now, uh, uh, you have after after stopping again you have loaded the sample and it started deforming it. Okay. So, you can see that it has started from the same point where you have left, but if uh, I stop this and keep the material at room temperature or maybe a little bit higher temperature for some time what will happen is that you will see that there is again a reappearance of the this yielding point phenomena at this point it has not it was not there but if i after unloading uh, at y point suppose i keep it for some time and i allow aging to take place okay maybe artificial aging room temperature aging you will see that again the yield point phenomena has reappeared okay and this is because you are giving a time for carbon nitrogen this interstitial atoms to go and sit at the dislocation core okay so again now dislocation will have to come across this defect uh, this point defects to start the yielding phenomena so if i am not doing the aging then i you will not see this yield point phenomena and uh, it will start from where you have left. Strain aging should be eliminated for example, in deep drawing steels it, it leads to surface marking or stretcher strains. Okay. 
the amount of carbon nitrogen should be lowered by adding elements such as aluminum vanadium and so on okay so these uh, atoms uh, will react or will form some kind of carbides and so on so there will not be interstitial atoms uh, or, or carbon is interstitial atom but it will form either aluminum nitride for for example with nitrogen or titanium carbide for with titanium and so on so they will form carbides and nitrides and they will not be in free uh, condition okay not in interstitial position okay so and this has to be removed because for example in deep drawing still as i told you if you want to make a car body and so on all these marks will be uh, seen on the surface of the sheet then there is another pr problem called dynamic strain aging usually it happens at higher temperature okay so for example you can see at room temperature there is no problem you have a nice flow curve at some intermediate temperature you start seeing that there is a serrations on the stress strain diagram okay and these serrations are because of dynamic strain aging okay so th this is basically repeated yielding due to high speed of diffusion of solute atoms to catch and lock dislocation so what is happening is it is like a cat and mouse game between dislocation and the solute atoms so dislocation is moving solute atom can also diffuse at high temperature at room temperature solute atom diffusivity will be very low we have already seen in diffusion that uh, so diffusion depends on the temperature so as dislocation is moving my atoms can also diffuse okay so if if the velocity of dislocation and uh, solute atom is kind of matching then you will see that uh, this cat and mouse game is going on between dislocation and the solute atom and of course very high temperature the there there will the, the solute atom will be able to go diffuse with the dislocation so there is no problem okay and the problem with dynamic strain aging is it is not good for the ductility of the material okay the ductility where you see this dynamic strain aging the ductility of the material comes down okay and this effect of dynamic stretching is called portivian le chatelier effect okay so with this uh, i thank you so we have discussed the interaction between the point defects and the dislocations and uh, it can be used as a strengthening mechanism as well as it kind of sometime gives you problems which we have to understand to uh, to get rid of those problems okay so that is what we have understood Okay so now next we we will see another strengthening mechanism in the next lecture okay so thank you